Don't frazzle my sh- It's the Woodworking Morning Show. whistled the song every single time i can't help it it's such a uh, happy whistly song it is well hey everybody i'm mark i'm nicole and we're going to do a woodworking show for you today live not, not actually going to do woodworking no we're just going to talk about woodworking just in case there's any confusion uh but thank you for hanging out with us mm-hmm. we always appreciate it uh did you know that you can actually help support this show totally yeah. can and yeah. the other shows and all the other shows and all the other shows <laughs> patreon.com slash woodwhisperer <laughs> and then also right here on youtube there should be a join or a membership button that you can uh, click below the video that's uh, just a couple of bucks a month whatever it is you feel like doing uh, but you also get some perks like the after show mm-hmm. the after as show? well as some extra content and uh, by that extra content i mean sometimes i film stuff in the shop if i'm working mm-hmm. on something i might just do a quick little video of that and post that very off the cuff vlog style simple stuff but and lots of give, fun we give you a shout out we do indeed just so. like those people so Randy, Randy, uh, I don't know how to say. Want me to do it? Tharl- Tharlson? Randy Tharaldson. Uh, Dan Killen. Killen? Ja- Janet, Janet McPhail. Dustin Eastfold. Eastfold. East- East- no. Eastfold. <laughs> uh, Craig Kleimschmidt. Mike. Are, your screen is really dark. I know. Mike, just Mike. And then Bodnar 11. Bodnar 11. Hey, oh, look, I brightened it up for you. There you go, just after I was done. Perfect timing. <laughs> All right. So thank, thank you, you, everybody, who, who helped us out. Um, and, of course, the, the best thing you could do to help us out is to be here. Hang to out. Actually watch hang the Hang out with us. Watch the show. Even if you're not live, watch it after. Or if you are live, ask a question, participate. So speaking of questions, I have some pre-selected from some of the people who, who did help us out. And Nicole will be looking at the chat room, grabbing some more questions. And that's what we're here to do today is just answer as it's many questions Saturday as we can. Saturday night. We normally do this on a Friday night. That's right. But uh, one word. Kid. Family? Kids. Oh. Kids. <laughs> More specific. <laughs> More specifically. Yeah. So. Okay, quick uh, <laughs> couple announcements. If you haven't seen it, yesterday we posted a new video. Let's see if I can give you a little picture of that. It's the Aww. day bed. There's me and John. That looks nice. Looking kind of weird. Uh, great little video. If you want to see that go together, that is on the same channel. You are watching this video on right now. It looks, your face looks like you are kneeling on something very painful. Yeah, I think it's actually John pinching my butt. <laughs> you just can't see it. So uh, go check that out. Also, here, here's something we don't mention often enough. You guys like winning free stuff, right? Oh, yeah, I do. Well, we have a podcast called Wood Talk. Been around for a audio long time. Audio podcast. Yeah, it is an audio podcast. Do we have to specify that anymore? Sometimes really? I think so. Really? I mean, really? Yeah. I guess so. Anyway, Rockler is a sponsor of that show, and they do a giveaway every single month. So you don't really have to do anything other than go to rockler.com slash woodtalk, and then every month they swap out for something new. So I think this month is the Dust Right Separator, the big blue bucket for uh, separating chips connecting to a shop vac. Yep, the Dust um, Right Separator. Yeah, great. It's a $99 value, a great little thing. Just go fill out that form, and you are entered to win. Oh, that's pretty cool. They so. do it every month. Do it every month, and they list the previous winners. Speaking of giveaways, tomorrow is August 1st, and I have a giveaway locked and loaded on the Wood Whisperer. What? Yep. So um, if you're watching this after August, between August 1st and August 31st, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, you can head on over to the woodwhisperer.com slash giveaway, and you'll see if you're in the U.S. It's, sorry, it's just U.S. Uh, Powermatic and uh, Mark are teaming up, and he, they are giving away the C table that you made specifically right. for the Powermatic 100 anniversary. Yeah, that was pretty cool. So uh, I'll be posting that tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Speaking, of, I totally forgot of it until I saw this. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's ready. It's but if you're before, if you're in the chat room right now, you're. Not going to see it there. Yeah. Now, look, a lot of you know we're, we're a family, you know, small family run business. Yeah. Uh, we've got two kids. We like to uh, to show you stuff <laughs> involving those kids sometimes. So uh, Saturday, pretty boring. I told the kids they're, they're walking around like they, they've got nothing to do. We're Meanwhile, bored. there's a, a house full of toys, so but whatever. Bored. Uh, so I gave them a camera and I said, go outside and make a movie. And they wanted to make an adventure film. Yeah. Right. And I was just going to edit it down for them. But then when I got these clips, they were the most creepy, adorable things I've ever seen. 
and I Abe, still owe them a real yeah, edit, yeah, yeah. but yeah. I decided to take about 20 minutes to make a horror movie Ava trailer. Ava is wearing her uh, Anna costume, like yeah. just the, like the, From black, Frozen. the black velvet dress. <laughs> <laughs> and her hair is a little messed up, yeah. and she's wearing... Uh, anyway, so uh, enjoy this. this we thought is, we uh, would, you would enjoy it. Yeah, know. I just posted this on social, but maybe you guys would like to see it. A little jump scare at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, uh, so yeah, uh, that was just a little bit of fun. Anyway, uh, the kids are great. Ava watched it. She goes, "That was a little creepy." Is it is meant to be creepy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So let's get to some questions. Well, we huh? just got a, a nice super chat. I won't ban you, Cave Troll, <laughs> just yeah. because you guys rock. Thanks, Cave well, Troll. Well, thank you. That we appreciate that. Nice. And I uh, just wanted to say welcome to our new member. 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 Fred. Fred. I roll. Is that, how do you say? Uh, Fred Earl? Earl. 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 So. Sorry, Fred, we're destroying your name. Yes, but we, we appreciate hey. your support, and uh, thanks for hanging out. That's what you get when you join <laughs> join the Wood Whisperer. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. All right, so let's get to our questions today. So I have a question here from Jeff Barry. He says, I'm planning to make a chessboard, and hopefully eventually the chess pieces also. I wanted to ask your opinion about what would be the best wood to use to get a good contrast. I know maple and walnut, but wondering about other good options. Not Wenge. <laughs> good man. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, I was wondering if it would be easier to do laminates or solid wood, and also if it would be worth end grain for the squares or just use face grain. Okay, one question at a time here. I think... You said, would it be easier to do laminates or solid wood? It's definitely going to be easier to do solid wood. Is it better to do solid wood? I don't think so. I think when you're doing something like a chess or a checkerboard, um, the amount of movement that you can have sometimes with solid wood means you have to do certain things around the frame to accommodate that movement. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of doing something that involves, you know, if it's shop made veneer or laminates, whatever it is, um, do something that's stable. And I think you're going to be far happier with the results. Those lines will stay crisp, but they'll stay that way and they won't bust out of a frame if you put this thing in a frame, which a lot of times you do with things like this. Um, so I would go laminate, but let's move on to the other questions. Uh, let's see. So end grain for the squares, I don't think end grain makes a whole lot of sense. Like what would be, it's something you do for cutting boards. And if you like the look and you want to apply that look to a uh, chessboard or um, um, I think checkers when I think of this stuff because I don't know how to play chess. We need to teach you. Yeah, too late. Chess is fun. Yeah, uh, too far gone. Oh, stop. <laughs> but if you, you wanted- You don't watch the Queen's Gambit. <laughs> you don't watch the Queen's Gambit. Uh, <laughs> so if you wanted to do the end grain, that's available to you. I just don't see any major advantage to doing it. It's just probably gonna make things more difficult. Uh, and you asked for recommendations. So I'm, I'm just gonna throw a few out there that I think look nice together, chat room. You have good combinations that you think would look good for a checker or a chessboard. Um, oak and walnut maple and cherry, maple and mahogany, birch or beech as a sort of blonde species, and cherry, what about white oak, I'm not done. Oh. oh, this is a long list, Nicole. Okay. Uh, white oak and walnut, and then also look at the thermally modified woods. Um, those turn to a nice chocolate color. You can get some um, torrified ash. You do one science segment and you're all about the thermally. That's, that's my new thing. I have exactly <laughs> like one square foot of thermally modified wood in my possession and I'm very proud of it. But anyway, that stuff is a really dark chocolatey color, which would be a good compliment to, you know, you said I'm not, thinking, not winky. I'm uh, thinking Paduk. Ooh, like, Paduk. Paduk and so that would be the dark and then the light would be, I don't know. Like, Got to be careful with those exotics, though. Something like bleed? Paduke has the potential to bleed. Uh, so we would, I mean, it's not I impossible, know? but you got to be careful with it. Hey, um, got a couple super chats while you're yapping away. Oops, don't, I don't want to ban you. See, uh, you do it too. I know, I accidentally. Uh, thank you, Judy, in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. <laughs> Our kids are pretty scary, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, kids are scary. And then um, Paul Engel made me do a double take. And he said, thanks for the incredible Rubo build instructions. What an incredibly accelerated accelerator, accelerator for, for working work. growth. Well, wow, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Can we send you a shirt or something? I know. I feel like I need to, need to send you something send, uh, here. One of our kids? <laughs> something. 
Anything? No. Let us know, Paul, if we could uh, send you something. Look hey, in our store. Paul, We're I have happy to. I have some new stickers. Oh, we have an anniversary I, coming up. We have up. an anniversary coming yes. up, 15 years of the Wood Whisperer oh, yeah. in October, which, before you know it, I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to be here. So I'd be happy to, to send you some goodies. Email me, Nicole, at thewoodwhisperer.com. John K says Purple Heart and Yellow Heart. Mm. Very nice. Okay, let's get to the next question. Here. Okay. Mike. Mike says, I'm getting some paint bubbling on a chair that I painted about a month ago. I used bare marquee outside paint. What causes this and what should I do about them? All right, so here's the thing. You know how we were getting videos of like pros throughout the industry to help us oh, answer yeah, yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you guys know paint's yeah, not my thing. No. I very rarely use paint, so I'm not the best person to answer this question. So I figure we go to a pro. Um, the problem is... Turns out they're busy. <laughs> painters seem to be very busy and are unable to accommodate... My request. Um, so look, I got a sec what I'm gonna call a second best option. He's not a painter exclusively, but the guy knows what the heck he's doing. He's usually pretty helpful. Let's see what he has to say. I don't know, just pop the bubbles. All right, thanks for that, Matt. Uh, really appreciate it. Always informative. He's so helpful. Always helpful. So helpful. Always willing to lend a hand. But That's he's Matt full Cremona. of crap. Yeah. I don't, again, I'm gonna throw out the most generic bad answer for you. Uh, paint bubbling, maybe there wasn't a good primer on it. Maybe this, it's a, maybe a surface prep issue. Is too, does heat cause bubbles? Heat could, but I don't know how much heat this, I mean, it's an exterior paint. Yeah. So as long well, as it was applied sense. correctly, yeah, yeah, yeah. but a bubble to me indicates some kind of a lifting that's happening yeah. where there's an adhesion problem. Maybe so. if we hear from one of the painters we reached out to. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll give you that answer. I'll, I'll send it to you through Patreon. Something better than that. <laughs> Because, you know, Matt and I aren't going to take you very far here. <laughs> I got a question here from uh, Kyle Chandler. Bing. Uh, I was getting smoke from my plunge router bit. I mm -hmm. think it was building up on the bit. Is that possible? What's the best way to clean it? Well, absolutely. Um, the more you use a bit, the more you start to dull that bit. The duller it gets, the more friction you have, the more heat builds up, and the more it turns into like a crust on the bit and that just exacerbates the problem and makes it even worse over time. So that definitely happens. Typically that's the first sign that the bit is on its way out, but you can clean it. So if you get a pitch and resin remover, a uh, simple green, mm -hmm. if you really want to get hardcore, some kind of an oven cleaner or something can be used to try to get all that crap off of the bit. See if you can get it clean, wax it up and then try to use it again. The problem is once you start seeing that, at least in my experience, I find that that's the first sign that things are going downhill. Mm -hmm. um, so don't be surprised if you get it all cleaned up, everything looks great and you go to use it again and it starts to smoke within a few passes, right? So just the nature of the beast. John Ulrich in the chat, who's our mod, says when, when mine has bubbled, it's always been because it was too cold or I thinned it too much before spraying. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. See, I don't do anything with paint, so I'm not your guy. <laughs> uh, but Okay, Jeffrey Smith says, Question on the rubber floor mats that you have in your shop. I have some samples from the same company and I'm thinking of upgrading when I move to a shop this fall. How do they stand up to mobile tool bases? Can you move tools around with a reasonable effort or do they buckle and move under the weight of the tools? My cheap Harbor Freight mats are really challenged by movement and I'm thinking the upgrade may be worthwhile. Well, disappointing news for you, Jeffrey. Even if you have like full coverage, which I did in Arizona, I don't really mm -hmm. have complete coverage here. Uh, but even if you have full coverage, if you roll a heavy tool on that, it's buckling. There are times when I've had deliveries and the person is pulling something in with a pallet jack. And if it hits one of those rubber tiles, it starts off okay, but then the compression happens and it starts to fold, turns into this little wave that wants to carry through the whole piece and it's a mess. So if you have a substantial heavy tool, not gonna happen. Lighter things like chairs. Um, I might be able to get my 14 inch bandsaw on its mobile base. I could probably get that up on there, but that's not a really super heavy tool. Um, but if I try to roll maybe my planer, table saw, anything really with substantial weight, I don't think it's gonna really make you very happy. So uh, it's a good idea to keep, at least the way I do this, I keep the tools on the concrete and I build my walkway around it. Uh, this way you don't have to worry about it. So when you do need to move a tool, you just pull them up and you make a pathway to get where you need to go and then move it back when you're done. Um, that's, that's my best recommendation, but if it's a really heavy tool, even those, uh, they're called strong rubber tiles at that company, Rubber Flooring Inc., um, even those are going to have a problem with really heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Okay, Kim Erickson, our buddy Kim down under, I think, right? I always, She's con on I always confirm yeah, this every Australia, time. Australia, yes. <laughs> Could be another Kim Erickson, I don't know. <laughs> if you only had a job site table saw and you didn't have a track saw, only a circular saw, what would be the best way to break down plywood for cabinet carcasses? Well, I think what I would do is try to simulate a track saw. Sorry. What are you doing? I'm Hands working. off my track pad, just, lady. Just do your thing. I'm gonna get a laptop with a very small track pad so you don't have as easy of a target here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I would I would try to simulate a, a track saw as much as possible by making my own guide. So I've done this in the past. You could just get a you know piece of um, you know scrap material that's maybe eight feet in length. I mean, as long as you need it to be, um, certainly to cover a full sheet would be nice. Uh, and then you just get another piece of maybe a quarter inch thin strip of material. If you can run that nice and straight, that now is the fence for your saw. Your saw can ride along that make that first cut to get a nice clean cut. And now you've got this edge guide that you could put down, clamp in place, and then run your circular saw, kind of like a track saw. The difference being it's, you know, you still have the ability for it to veer out, uh, but as long as you keep the pressure on and you keep it pushing into the track, it should actually be okay. And if you want to get fancy about it, there might be things you can do using grooves in the base of the circular saw to possibly make it so it actually is riding in something like a track. Um, that's the way I would handle it. Always want to break those things down, especially if you have a job site saw. It's really distracting to have your arm here. <laughs> Thank you. If, <laughs> if you actually have a, um, a job site saw that's a fairly small saw and you're going to want your parts to be pretty small uh, before you put those on there. Gazek, Anything else you need to do? Gazek wants to know if the 15 year is a new logo. It's the old logo. It's a play on the old logo. It's a logo. play on the old logo. Yeah. Uh, Call Me Mac did a super chat. I wanted you to say thank you to him. Did you put that up there yet? Okay, there you it did. is. Uh, <laughs> hey, you can buy a Corona now. Hey, Yay! thanks, Call Me Mac. Thank you. I love them pesos. And uh, Paul, I knew I recognized Paul's because I just say he just shared his Rubo build in the Guild Facebook mm -hmm. group, and I saved it for the newsletter, and I sent it to you uh, right here. It's absolutely beautiful. I thought I'd share it with you. I don't know if you're you can... assuming I could easily do this and get back. Yeah. Let's hope mm -hmm. this works. We'll see. Ooh, Paul, well, look that's at that thing. beautiful. That is beautiful. So nicely done. Let's see if we can recover. Are I we just recovered? Did it. Yep. Wow. Love a good look Rubo. at that. I learned that trick last time. Amazing job, Paul. Okay, uh, Ben Price. Ben Price has a smallish shop, 23 by 18. He says, I was debating putting the table saw along the wall with the longer side facing out into the room. I have a track saw to break down cheat goods uh, outside before bringing them in. Is this a dumb idea? I know you had a small shop before Nicole gave you the garage space. Any advice is appreciated. Well, I always- nice dig in there. Yeah. <laughs> I always put my saw as close to the middle of the floor as possible because I wanted, to, wanted all that room around it. So I never tried to be that strategic about it. <sighs> so the way you described it though, you said that you would put the long side against the wall. To me, the long side is either the back of the saw or the front of the saw. And neither one of those is something I would want to see put against the wall. So maybe you mean the short side goes against the wall, limiting how far your outfeed can go or the left side outfeed extension is what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. So either way though, it sounds like you're, you're, what you're contemplating is, should I put it in an inconvenient position and count on being able to cut my stuff down beforehand? Sure, try it. I mean, if it works out, great. If not, lots of people do put a saw kind of up against the wall, limiting how much they can use, but then they break stuff down so that they never have to go full capacity. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, give that a shot. It's probably worth it. So we normally don't stream on Saturday. So it's always interesting to see who else streams on Saturday. It looks like Carl Jacobson is streaming right now. Oh, no kidding. He's turning, I'm sure. Very nice. Looks like he's turning a segmented bottle opener and stopper set. Well, nobody go there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> We're busy here. We're doing stuff. Um, Mark Patterson. No, he, he's a good guy. He's a great guy. Cool. Um, Mark Patterson did a super chat mm -hmm. and asked you, any recommendations for a dark finish for maple? Uh, like a stain? A I'm, dark stain? I'm assuming. Because maple is light, right? Depends on what you want to do. You're going to have to watch blotch on maple, right? Anything you go dark on maple is going to want to blotch. So maybe well, look you, into some blotch control. Or watch the video that he... Somebody just did a video did on a that. a video. You could do it yourself. Yeah. Uh, you're going to want to look at different types of um, uh, stains. You may even try to buy a few and test them out. I've had good luck with General Finish's dye stains. Those are fantastic. Um, a gel stain might be a good option too. But you're really going to want to test it out and make sure you like what you see. Um, because it's... 
sometimes not always as as good as you think it's going to be um taking a really blonde wood like maple to a really really take it to a dark place you see my spag stick <laughs> you like that uh-huh. it's going to make an appearance soon in what is that even oh it's just a preview and i can't uh, talk about all it. right don't want right. to spoil it all right so i'll link to uh mark's blotch control video it came out just last month well yeah it's still july so it came out in june so. Yeah, no, in normal, like, Wood Whisperer speak, that would have been six months ago. I know, i right. But now it's just a few no, weeks ago. it's just a few weeks. Um, okay. Can you grab that board right over there sure. for me? Please. So, Mark Waida, or Waida, has a question. I got myself into Wida. a f- Wida, uh, friendly argument with someone who made Where's a cutting board. Words? Right there. This one? That, that's the one. Um, so, he's in an argument with somebody. He said, edge grain, and I commented that it looked like a combination of edge and long grain. Other comments back that uh, the edge, long, and face grain are all the same thing. I forget what episode you did. Okay, did you explain that type? Let's see. So basically he's asking edge grain, end grain, face grain, or long grain. So sometimes it, it like depends on the orientation of the wood, the kind of wood you purchased, right? So here's a standard flat saw on board. This is what we would call the face. This is what we would call the edge. And of course, this is the end grain. So if I were to make this into a cutting board, if I wanted it all to be edge grain, I would have to have all the things facing up this way. If I didn't mind having a face grain cutting board, it would be like this. So this gets a little bit tricky when you start to think about different cuts of wood. So when you have a quarter sawn board, that just means it was sawn from the log in a different way. And now things are kind of reversed, right? So when you turn this piece up this way, this edge, is kind of a quarter sawn face, right? And that gets quite confusing. So that's why I often don't think too much about edge and face grain in terms of differentiation, because I think of edge and face grain as related to the board's orientation in space. And this is the face and this is the edge. If this were a quarter sawn board, the grain would be running a different way and I would still call this the face and I'd still call that the edge. Right, so the properties of edge grain and face grain are pretty similar. I don't, uh, I don't want to say that you lost the argument, but I want to say that, yes, there are differences when you're looking at the board, but when you actually look at a, let's say a wide, if this board were really thick and I showed you a strip like that, you might not be able to tell that it's edge or face grain because they can look so similar, right? And it, again, it just depends on the board that you're holding. So, yeah. It's a hard thing to answer because I would need to see what the material actually looked like, but I'm going to be in favor of the people who say that there's not actually that much difference between long face grain, long uh, edge grain. Does that make sense? That's a terrible explanation. I apologize. It's a hard thing to explain. Uh, Drew. Drew did a super chat. Uh, Restoring an old dresser. Okay. Uh, The top drawer is a curvy surface with a veneer and it's peeling at the edges, how would you repair this? Or would you redo the veneer? If you like the veneer, don't redo it. Uh, If it's peeling at the edges, that's usually a repairable thing. So if you get yourself maybe, uh, I mean, it depends on what the adhesive is. Sometimes you could just reactivate it. If it's really old and it was like hide glue or something like that, well, then you just kind of heat it with a little bit of moisture. You might be able to reactivate the glue and get it to sit back down. It's like flaking, like the nightstand Mm -hmm. upstairs, Mateo's old nightstand, the top of it is gnarly. But he's talking about a veneer lifting. Uh, That's just deterioration from moisture, probably from the humidifier that we used to put on that thing. Um, he's talking about the corner of a veneer gotcha. lifting. So, and I mean, if that's not the case, if it's more of a modern adhe- adhesive in there, then what you might want to do, as long as it goes down nice and smooth and doesn't cause problems, uh, you could throw some epoxy in there. Try to clean it out first, uh, then throw some epoxy in there, put a clamp on it, see how it goes. Because if you don't have to re-veneer everything, that sounds good to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd rather not have to do that. If you're itching for an excuse to, to re-veneer it, then go ahead and do it. Mountain Jam just did a super chat. Have you ever eaten Mountain Jam? No. <laughs> when uh, when I see Mountain Jam, I'm thinking mm. Leonard Skinner. Yeah, like music. <laughs> Play me some mountain music. <laughs> it's not Leonard Skinner though. I know. Okay. <laughs> but just got kind. my first bench top <laughs> joiner, and I'm struggling to get rid of a bow, even on short pieces of wood. It's acting like a planer. I've set it up best as I can. Is it me or the jointer? Well, look, Mountain Jam. Uh, I don't like bench top jointers. I know people sometimes that's like that's what's in the budget. That's all you can get. You do the best you can with it, and you know someday you might have the option to upgrade. 
Um, I had a bench top joiner for a little while. I hated that thing, absolutely hated it. So it's not to say that you can't get it calibrated so that it works a little bit better. I'm saying it's very difficult to get them calibrated and to keep them that way. So don't be too hard on yourself on this, but there certainly should be a possibility of you putting in enough effort into this thing or maybe just working with it long enough to figure out its little idiosyncrasies and like just figuring out what makes it actually produce a flat result. Um, there's usually a way to do that. But that said, I have encountered tools that had so much plastic on them and so much uh, mobility in the, you know, the in-feed and the out-feed tables that even if you had it calibrated, just a little bit of pressure knocks it out. How are you supposed to get a good result from something like that? So, eh, it's one of those things. Um, I don't want to make you feel like just because you have a benchtop model that you can't get good results, um, but I don't think you should be too hard on yourself. That's not the easiest thing to do. So yeah, it does sound like it needs calibration, um, but man, if he already did everything mm -hmm. he, he knows to do, I don't, I don't really know what to tell you. Uh, APV uh, said Rob Kosman just ended his stream 45 minutes ago. So oh. Rob. A lot was, of people do Saturdays, yeah. huh? Yeah. Hmm. Nice super chat from Patrick Joseph. What do you know? Uh, Patrick Joseph. Thank Never you, Patrick. trust a man with two first names, Nicole. <laughs> it could be his first in his middle. It could be. How was the electric heaters affected your electric bill? Looking for a heating solution for my new shop on the small side. You'd probably better prepare to answer uh, that. Now keep I, in mind, yeah, we, moved we still, to a mini we still split. use electric, but it's okay. a mini split now. Yeah. Um, it's not the same thing as like an electric forced air heater, right. which is what I had two of before. Um, that definitely impacted the electric bill. The mini split did. I really didn't notice much with the the little heaters. Hold up. So you're saying that the mini split is costing us more money than when we ran the two heaters? I think it is. I don't I think you're crazy. I can go back to the bills. Every I think you use the mini split more. Let me say that. That's definitely a strong likelihood. Yeah. Because it's meant to just kind of run continuously. Right. Um also we had we had situations that have changed where we had Jason start working for mm -hmm. us. Uh, and then we went right to John working for us. So there were times when I didn't have an employee that we might not be in the shop for a day or two in a row. Um, so I think being here five, you know, at least five days a week and having to keep it comfortable for an employee, that also changed the frequency. Mm -hmm. um, but theoretically, to my understanding, there's no way that two forced air electric heaters would be cheaper than a mini split in a side-by-side -side, if run in comparable ways, mm -hmm. let's say that. But, gotcha. uh, but I mean, what, what kind of difference did it make? Can you recall? Not, not much. Like, not huge. maybe not, not something I was like, holy moly. Um, I that's so different than I normally. From the office across the house. Mark! <laughs> <laughs> what is this bill? Yeah. No, I, nothing that made me say, wow, that's, yeah. that's costing us too much. Yeah, and I think once you know it's costing you money, you tend to go like, well, I can kind of tolerate it a little bit colder. Yeah. Uh, maybe I won't turn it up too hot because it's going to cost me a lot of money. Um, okay, I got I, I don't know if I'm skipping people. No, nope, you got There's it. There's a super chat from Call Me Mac. What's the best size for a bandsaw F slash, for, I guess, four rough lumber? Well, I mean, I've seen people do stuff with rough lumber that's, you know, on a 14-inch bandsaw. You, you can certainly use that. It's not ideal. Um, I've got a Powermatic 15-inch bandsaw, and that's the biggest saw that I have. I have no problem plowing through rough lumber, cutting things down with a 15. If you're doing a lot of this stuff, you know, you're, you're, you're like a Cremona or something, and you need to cut through lots of big timbers, you may want something a little bit bigger, bigger saws. This is, this is getting kind of annoying. Sorry. <laughs> It's like, hold on, hold on. What are you, are you doing? Are you doing something over here? Um, if you have, if you're doing this a lot, you know, maybe a 20 inch might not be a bad idea. 18 or 20, uh, and the sky's the limit for there. But I think if you're doing, a, if you're doing a decent amount, well, okay, let's let's look at it this way. Look at the stuff that I do, and a 15 inch works great for me. So I don't know if that uh, if that helps you with that question. Uh, you already did Drew's question, but you missed Beth. Oh. And you're scrolling right up. Beth off. Stitt. Is it possible to get more details on the kitchen pantry? I love it, and I'm adding it to the hubby's to-do list. Well, if you email me, I can send you a terrible SketchUp drawing. And uh, <laughs> I didn't make a plan for that. I So you'll see with the SketchUp drawing, a lot of times when I do a project, I get a SketchUp drawing that's like 75% of the way there. And what I mean is a fully formed model. 
it's not a correct model. Some of the things are just the facade and you look on the inside and you're like, where's the rest of the drawer? I didn't need to know the rest of the drawer. I just needed to know how that drawer front was gonna lay out. So I am more than happy to share that working document, uh, but please don't expect a whole lot out of it. That was a complicated project that got away from me and uh, that'll give you some basic measurements, but I can only provide it with no warranty. And mm -hmm. if something's not right, I can't help you. Do you got more Patreon I questions? Can answer, I can answer questions about it, but I can't necessarily give you more like measurements and stuff, yeah. if that makes sense. Okay, what, what was it? Oh, do, my questions. Do you yeah. have more questions? Jeez, we're, we're rolling with the chat room here. Um, okay, so. Sebastian, I yes. think is your last one. Oh no, there was two I got marks. one more from Mark. Okay. He says, um, this may be a repeat, but uh, do you do other projects while waiting for glue ups or your finish to dry? I do not. No, typically if, if I have a project that's in the middle of drying or I've got a glue up, to me starting another project is just potential for something to get in my way. And I'm kind of a, a one project dude um, and don't really want to start another one until that one is done. So just me personally. Um, the other thing is I have a lot of other things that I could be doing. So if we, if we have a project that's in the clamps, there probably is something else we could prep for the next thing that we're about to do or something, you know, even just cleaning up or something like that. But very rarely can I split my brain to actually start a whole nother project. Uh, Doug Wall asked me how my neck was doing. You've been around for a while, Doug. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. I'm fine. I still have problems with my left arm on occasion, mm -hmm. um, but... I just let it heal and yep, I'm all good. Her uh, arm wrestling career is down the tube though. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you that thanks, much. Uh, thanks to CBD, that's actually what helped me through the pain. So none okay. of the other medication did. Sebastian Marchand says, I'm building kitchen cabinets with some pre-finished plywood. Uh, it's finished only on one side and I was wondering how important it is to put finish on the non-finished face. Uh, it won't be exposed, but some of these panels will have some exposure to the air. The back of the cabinet is recessed three-eighths into the cabinet. The cabinets will be assembled and put in storage for a few months in my basement before the installation. The unfinished face of each cabinet will be exposed during that time. Should I get an HVLP sprayer and apply a light coat of varnish, or is it fine to leave these panels unfinished? I guess that if I apply some finish, I'll have to do this ASAP after assembling the cabinets. Okay, well, Sebastian, none of that really matters that much. You don't have to do it. You don't have to wait. You don't have to do it right away. You, the inside of a cabinet doesn't need to be finished. Um, it can be. So think the, the way I like to think of it is, are you gonna be doing cleaning on the inside of that cabinet? If so, you probably don't want raw wood on the interiors, so put some kind of a finish. Now, I would not put a varnish necessarily. I would do something probably water-based or maybe even a lacquer, just something that dries quickly and doesn't retain a lot of odor. You don't really want to put like an oil-based varnish on the interior, but you don't have to do anything. Um, at the very least, I would say get the bottom of the cabinets, unless you plan to put like that, um, what's that stuff called? Like contact paper uh, that some, sometimes people put in the bottom of a cabinet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, to yeah. protect it. Or I used to put in my locker when I was <laughs> kid. That, that stuff. <laughs> um, Back to school, <clears throat> you'll, be, you'll be able to find it. But at the same time, when you're asking about time frames, plywood doesn't really move, right? So even though um, you, you put it in your basement, you could let it sit there as long as you want and apply finish uh, when, when it suits you. It's not going anywhere. My shop cabinets, I have not put finish on the interiors of those, partially because I'm lazy, but also because it doesn't really matter, especially in the shop environment. Inside a kitchen, again, maybe a different story. You might want to finish those interiors. Totally up to you. Patrick Joseph did a follow-up super chat and said, thank you for answer. Uh, it is my first and middle. It was about the shop heater. First and middle yeah. shop heater? He was asking about the, the heater. Yeah, but how does first and middle I don't know. Re reference the shop heaters? We're missing something. How does the comment. electric affect your electric? Looking for heating solution for my shop on the small side. Okay. I don't see how <laughs> those two are related, but <laughs> I'm sure he's talking about something else. Thank you, Patrick. And that is, that's all my questions. I have some good questions. I've been gathering questions as you've been jibber jabbering. Um, got one here, jibber jabber. Somebody asked, what is, who, who's the I've person? Already, I've already said. Okay. It's Mayor Goldie Wilson. Um, I like the sound of that. Speaking of off topic, yeah. new season on Netflix of the movies that made us and they did Back to the Future. Yep, it was really good. Uh, Ryan Werner. I live in Western North Carolina, so it's humid. I'm starting 
in woodworking and I need to figure out wood storage. Small backyard shop, no climate control, and not much room. How do I keep wood projects ready? How do I keep wood project ready? How do I keep the wood project ready? Oh, gotcha. Project ready. Gotcha. Well, it's a little bit tricky, especially in humid places. Work fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I would love to hear from the chat room from people who live in humid environments. I live in a very dry environment, so it's not as much of a concern for me. But you have basically two things to think about. So you got the wood coming in. You're going to let it acclimate a little bit. While you work on the project, it's in your shop. So whatever the condition of your shop is, the closer the wood is already to that condition and has its you know, um, equilibrium moisture content, the better off you are while building it. It means that it's just going to stay stable. If you go away for a couple of days and come back to the project, it's not as likely to get all wonky on you. So that's kind of one school of thought is to keep the wood somewhere in the shop so it's matching the shop environment. There's another school of thought that says if the interior of the house that you're putting this into is drastically different than the shop conditions, it might actually be better to store the wood, as unrealistic as it is, to store the wood inside the house and then bring it into the mm -hmm. shop to do the work, get the work done, and if possible, get the stuff back into the shop at the end of the day. Um, I remember in Phoenix, mm -hmm. there was a Luther school mm -hmm. where they actually had rooms that were climate controlled. So they would keep all the materials in those rooms. And then at the end of the day, or at, when they start their work day, they bring everything out. But when they're not working on something, it goes back into that room where it's a controlled set of conditions. Um, that's probably easier on an instrument than it is on like a high boy. <laughs> but that's the two ways you have to think about it. So storing the wood, I think is probably best storing it in the place that's closest to its the loca like the location a piece of furniture is going to go but it's unrealistic to do that all the time on bigger pieces of furniture so if you're in a human environment and you have a situation like he does what, what what do you guys do do you have any tactics that work really well how do you prevent the wood from essentially getting built and everything's fine and you put it inside the house and it sort of is shocked into whatever the conditions are in the house I'm done. Okay. Uh, last minute Patreon question came in. Uh, actually, a few it looks like maybe. When did these? This mm -hmm. was five hours ago. Uh, did you do Karen G's Fact or Fiction? No, I don't think so. Uh, Karen said, Fact or Fiction, putting one to two coats of shellac on wood before planing or routering, especially end grain, may help reduce tear out because it binds the fibers together and makes them stronger. By the way, I love my fuel coffee mug. Well, good. I'm glad you, you <laughs> like it. I like mine too. So she's asking, true or false? I don't know, Karen. I've never tried that. That sounds like a real big waste of time, though. Um, if you're if if you're getting, I don't know, maybe you just have a really temperamental piece. You have a drill bit that you're hesitant to to go and replace because it's the only one you have. So now you have no choice but to come up with some some way to help prevent tear out. I guess that would be an option. Mm -hmm. But if you have a sharp bit and you're doing things properly and taking light cuts and not like really digging into something, it's not something I would ever even think about doing. So if you want to try it, if you feel that's going to solve some problems for you, the logic, I guess, see, I don't even know that the logic is sound. I mean, sometimes tear out happens because of uh, brittleness, right? So if you, if you start to do something to seal it up, yeah, I'm going to change my answer. Because I'm thinking in terms of something impregnating the wood, which it's really not. It's more just the surface, surface treatment, yeah. which is almost like putting a piece of tape on it, which is something that we do to reduce tear out. So I'm going to say there's probably, there's probably some logic in it and that it probably will work a little bit. But wow, that sounds like something that I would never want to spend any time doing. Don't you have to wait for it to dry? And Shall I dry as yeah. quickly? Okay. So it wouldn't be too bad of a wait. But can you imagine doing that like more than once? Like, I, don't, I don't see, there's other ways to prevent tear out that I think make a whole lot more sense, but maybe it's solving a problem that yeah. there's no other way to solve. Uh, Adam Nesvold says, a friend asked me to help them build a four to five foot elevated king or qu king, queen or king size bed mm -hmm. with a built-in closet, dresser, and hidden drawers in the headboard. Whoa. Uh, he's using reclaimed lumber from a barn style farmhouse for the project and he wants to be able to take Town, town the Take bed. Take down? Down. <laughs> it says Just, town. Yeah, it's a team. It's okay. <laughs> Take down the bed structure so he can move it when they move into their new home in the future. What joinery would you suggest to support to use for the post aprons and runners? He has six by six. What's that? Six by sixes, six by twos. 
and he wants to use for that purpose. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Would that Festool connector be something? Well, yes, but I don't want to just say, go get a domino. Like, yeah. if you don't already have a I domino. I think he wants you to tell him to go get a domino. Well, <laughs> Adam Lee like a, Mesvold. You need to charge this guy enough to get yourself a domino. Yeah, I mean, this sounds like this project, frankly, is going to be a pain in the butt. So <laughs> get something out of it, like a domino. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, um, when it comes to knockdown hardware, the Domino connector is super expensive, but the best out there. Uh, I haven't found anything better than that. We've used them on two bed projects in the Wait, past. Mark I used has a, it, a video on it, too. Yep, I used it in my office, on my desk, and um, they just work great. The great thing is if you just have an Allen wrench, it's something that you can very easily undo when he needs to move it in the future. I think that would work great. And then built into the system, because you've got a Domino, the Dominoes themselves. So the actual joinery will be domino joinery, but it's the, the DF500 or even the 700 connectors that are kind of holding that thing uh, nice and tight, but the dominoes themselves are the joints. That's my best recommendation, just in terms of like uh, easiest and probably best results. Now, coming down from there, there's lots of ways you can do a dry mortise and tenon joint and then use you know, some sort of a threaded rod or something to kind of cinch everything together, do the same thing those connector bolts were doing. He says he has access to a domino. Yeah, so you may it may be worth the investment into one of those uh, DF500 kits that contain all the little connectors and everything. Um, but again, there are other ways to do this, other types of knockdown hardware. I've done some big projects that were knocked down that I, before I had, actually before I think they even invented the mm -hmm. connectors. Um, where I just used uh, like threaded rods, nuts, and washers and try to hide them the best I can so that anytime there's an exposed nut or a head of a bolt, it's kind of in the back of the piece. But there's lots of ways that you can do that. Cross barrel dowel. nuts. Barrel nut. Oh, that we were just saying the same thing. Yeah. So cross dowel or barrel nut is a good option for something like this too. So quite a yep. few things you can do. Uh, I got a question here. Sounds like a doozy of a project, That huh? is a big one. I want a closet, uh, a bathroom. <laughs> Uh, also a powder room. <laughs> uh, I'd love to see it when you're done with it. Yeah, please send us pictures. Um, got a question here from Forge uh, 2008. When you built the gaming desks, mm -hmm. were you concerned about movement between the acrylic and the wood? Have there been any issues since you built them? No. I mean, mm -hmm. what's the acrylic going to do in, inside a house? Probably not moving all that much. Uh, if it did, it's very thin acrylic. So the most that would happen is you might get like a little bubble in there. Um, but we've never seen any movement mm -mm. on that acrylic at all. So no, mm -hmm. no, no worries about it. And um, I guess we haven't seen any problems to uh, cause us to worry about it. Wes Brown wants to know, why does my end grain cutting board cut like a Pringle? It's about one inch thick in a brick and mortar pattern mm -hmm. of mahogany and maple. It was initially flat yep. out of the drum sander, but it gets regular use. Because end grain sucks. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Yeah. End grain, if you think of it this way, the end grain is the thirstiest part of the board. So when we're looking at this handy prop that has served us now twice, um, if you're looking at where this board is going to take in moisture most readily, it's right here, the end grain. What are you doing on an end grain board? You're going, here's all this thirsty stuff, have at it, right? The whole thing is an end grain. So it's much more prone to pulling in moisture and then thankfully losing the moisture, but it also sucks it in. And when it gets that moisture in there, then the wood is just doing what a, a natural product does. It's uh, swelling fibers, things are moving, there's a give and take depending on which way the grain's running in this checkerboard sort of brick and mortar pattern that you have. So whatever happens, when this thing gets moisture in it, it cups, it probably calms down once it dries, I'm guessing. Um, but in the end, end grain cutting boards are just sometimes difficult. Um, this is one of the reasons why if I had to go like back to selling stuff, there's one thing I would probably never sell, cutting boards. I just would not want to warranty them uh, and especially knowing how people use them. Mm -hmm. Put even, them in the dishwasher. They do all kinds of <laughs> stuff. But even just regular use. I mean, yeah. I made the mistake of um, something spilled. This was years ago, but mm -hmm. something spilled leaked under the cutting board and because it was under the cutting board. We didn't know it was Yeah, it, no one knew and it was protected and didn't evaporate. And it just kept absorbing and absorbing until ksh, something just cracked mm -hmm. in the uh, in the end grain. So that's not to say that end grain cutting boards are all going to explode. I'm just saying you're asking a lot of the wood to behave forever. And it's probably not going to. Oh, behave. Oh, behave, you cutting board. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, John McCarthy. I like your question, John. 
Uh, do you ever wish halfway through a main site build project that you had filmed it like a guild build? Uh, You've had a few. Not while I was doing it. It's typically the feedback. Yeah. So if I finish the project and I have 20 people go, oh man, that should have been a guild build. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, uh, well, it's not. I don't, have, yeah. I don't have the footage to make it a guild build. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and the other thing is when I do a guild build, it actually means it's going to take a lot longer to document. It's a lot more work to do it that way. So, you know, I still think back on it and go, well, at least I got it done fairly quickly. You know, like the pantry cabinet would have been one that could have been a guild project. Mm -hmm. But I was mm -hmm. just flying by the seat of my pants and just wanted to get this thing done. If it was a guild project, I'd probably still be doing it. Uh, George Ohio says, um, could you use the, the juice like thing? The juice? The juice tunnel, whatever, whatever. The, the juice what, tunnel? The juice. The juice groove? The groove. Yeah. Use <laughs> like, it for what? Like, would that help to kind of... Says yeah. use. Oh no, he says mar use Mark Juice in the Mark end grain. Juice in the end grain. I just thought he meant the juice thing around the cutting board. He's talking about Mark Juice, baby. Um, would Mark uh, Juice help? You know, no, I don't know it? that I would do that. Yeah. I mean, you start to get into putting stuff on the cutting board that people don't want to see touching food. Um, so I probably would not <laughs> do that. I mean, that's the thing. If you're really looking to slow down the absorption, you got to put a decent you know, food safe finish on there. Certainly you can go to my old school way when I used to put varnish on cutting boards. I don't do that anymore, but um, it's still viable. Cremona does it all the time. Mm -hmm. That will definitely help slow down the absorption. But, um, you know, in the end, ew, it's just, I, I, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial that I don't think this whole end grade cutting board is a problem for anyone but woodworkers and people who know woodworkers. Mm -hmm. I think you give a chef a cutting board, they go, great, it's made out of wood, let's cut some stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have a whole lot of like chefs out there going, I only put my knives on end grain. I mm -hmm. will never touch face grain cutting boards. I only take a booze, Alan. It's, yeah, I need a booze, <laughs> a booze block. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I honestly think it's a woodworker thing. So if you don't want it to be so absorbent, then maybe look at a pattern that involves face or side grain, edge grain, instead of uh, end grain. That's a possibility too. John said he was looking at the walnut crotch credenza and mm -hmm. was so bummed there wasn't a full guild project for it. Sorry. Walnut crotch credenza. Oh, the one in our bedroom. Yes. That would have been a good guild it project. It would have been a good one. You ain't lying. Yeah. That was one of my favorite, actually, one of my favorite builds overall. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Osmo, Osmo, last question. By okay, the way. XL go. says I'm making a sled to use at the bottom table for a for the bench top planer. This will also help eliminate snipe at the end of the boards. Use glue up two three quarter MDF or melamine boards for stability. Is that a question? <laughs> I don't know if that was a question. I thought it was a question. I think he's offering advice to uh, someone else. Yes. Okay. So let's, that sounds like an answer to a question. Sorry. All right. Give me one more. Uh, one, two, three says, I want to get an MD MFT and bandsaw as a starter pack instead of a table saw. Okay. That that's also fine. is not a question. Not really a question, but that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I bless that idea <laughs> with my, my fairy <laughs> wand. Uh, Nicholas <laughs> Rupert. You got lucky, Nicholas. I don't know how to pull questions. I'm going to bless it with my spag stick. <laughs> uh, says, I'm getting ready to start the blanket <laughs> chest. Over the years, you have changed your preferred finishes. Yeah. Are there any other finish you would prefer to use today over the spray lacquer? Well, look at what I use today. Um, something like a blanket chest does not need a super heavy-duty finish. It just kind of sits there. and. Remember when we moved that blanket chest? And it, some, it got wet and there was like a yeah. stain on the something, carpet. Something got wet near the base. Yeah. And it probably was wet for enough time that yeah. it, it like brought some color into the carpet. That was a mess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these days I'm just into the hard wax oils. That's probably what I would use on it. Um, they, I did a green and green piece probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Uh, an entry table or an entry bench. That's what mm -hmm. it is. Green and green entry bench. And we used um, like a mahogany colored Rubio for that. And it turned out great. I loved it. So that would probably be along the lines of what I would do if I were to redo that uh, finish today. There you go. But that's not to say there's anything wrong. I, I, I would certainly hope when people see, look, we've been doing this for 15 years, right? Mm -hmm. And I was woodworking for four years or something before that. Yeah. Right? Was it? Something like that. But 
it's uh, so my woodworking career goes back almost 20 years in that period of time as new finishes come out new information comes out my you know i age my personal preferences what? change i do age believe it or not what? some people don't believe it because i kind of look exactly the same as i did in 2006 but i do age uh things you know uh, it's okay for people to change their opinions so just because i don't use catalyzed lacquer anymore which was a favorite of mine at the time and i don't really spray that much anymore that doesn't mean that these are bad finishes it just means that my personal preferences have changed and i've moved on to different products that's there you all go. so so hey we're going to do an after show where we talk about other things we can still talk about woodworking if you want we'll probably but watch the video of the kids again if you time. are a youtube member you have access to the after show under the community tab if you are a patreon supporter mm -hmm. i'm going to link to the patreon post where you just click click the little button yeah and that'll take you to it and uh just one more thing before we go i don't know just pop the bubbles <laughs> just pop the bubbles just everybody. pop the bubbles <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag. So thanks for hanging out. Pop Everybody that did Super Chats tonight, that was so kind of you. Uh, um, some really generous people tonight. Yes. So thank you so much. We do appreciate the support. And Gazank, thank you for making me laugh, even though I didn't say what you were saying. I was reading it. Was it funny enough to read? Probably, <laughs> right? I think so. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend, the rest of your Saturday night, and we will see you next Friday. Yes, Friday. Friday, our Friday. usual night Next Friday time. at 6.30 p.m. Yes. E Mountain. Okay, we're good. All right, toodles. Bye. Bye, everyone. Finish.